Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, Vintage International, Hindu Edition, read by Christopher Neal, Entered Apprentice Mason, and Presbyter. Chapter 8 It was a clean little room with a dark orange bedspread. The chair and dresser were maple, and there was a Gideon Bible lying upon a small table. I dropped my bags and sat on the bed. From the street below came the sound of traffic, the larger sound of the subway, the smaller, more varied sounds of voices. Alone in the room, I could hardly believe that I was so far away from home. Yet there was nothing familiar in my surroundings, except the Bible. I picked it up and sat back on the bed, allowing its blood-red edged pages to ripple beneath my thumb. I remembered how Dr. Bledsoe could quote from the book during his speeches to the student body on Sunday nights. I turned to the book of Genesis, but could not read. I thought of home and the attempts my father had made to institute family prayer. The gathering around the stove at mealtime and kneeling with heads bowed over the seats of our chairs. His voice quavering and full of church house rhetoric and verbal humility. But this made me homesick. And I put the Bible aside. This was New York. I had to get a job and earn money. I took off my coat and hat and took my packets of letters and lay back upon the bed, drawing a feeling of importance from reading the important names. What was inside, and how could I open them undetected? They were tightly sealed. I had read that letters were sometimes steamed open, but I had no steam. I gave it up. I really didn't need to know their contents, and it would be, and it would not be honorable or safe to tamper with Dr. Bledsoe. I knew already they concerned me and were addressed to some of the most important men in the whole country. That was enough. I caught myself wishing for someone to show the letters to. Someone who could give me a proper reflection of my importance. Finally, I went to the mirror and gave myself an admiring smile and I spread the letters upon the dresser like a hand of high trump cards. Then I began to map my campaign for the next day. First, I would have a shower, then get breakfast. All this very early. I'd have to move fast. With important men like that, you had to be one. You had to be on time. If you made an appointment with one of them, you couldn't bring them any slow CP colored people's time. Yes, and I would have to get a watch. I would do everything to schedule. I recall the heavy gold chain that hung between Dr. Bledsoe's vest pocket and the air with which he snapped his watch open to consult the time. His lips pursed, chin pulled in so that it multiplied, his forehead wrinkled. Then he'd clear his throat and give a deeply intoned order, as though each syllable were pregnant with nuances of profoundly important meaning. I recalled my expulsion, feeling quick anger and attempting to suppress it immediately. But now I was not quite successful. My resentment stuck out at the edges, making me uncomfortable. 
Maybe it was best, I thought hastily. Maybe if it hadn't happened, I would never have received an opportunity to meet such important men face to face. In my mind's eye, I continued to see him gazing into his watch. But now he was joined by another figure, a younger figure, myself, become shrewd, suave, and dressed not in somber garments like his old-fashioned ones, but in a dapper suit of rich material, cut fashionably like those of the men you saw in magazine ads, the junior executive types and Esquire. I imagined myself making a speech and caught in striking poses by flashing cameras, snapped at the end of some period of dazzling eloquence a younger version of the doctor, less crude, indeed polished. I would hardly ever speak above a whisper, and I would always be, yes, there was no other word, I would be charming. Like Ronald Coleman, what a voice. Of course, you couldn't speak that way in the South. The white folks wouldn't like it, and the Negroes would say you were putting on. But here in the North, I would slough off my southern ways of speech. Indeed, I would have one way of speaking in the North and another in the South. There was, that was the way. If Dr. Bledsoe could do it, so could I. Before going to bed that night, I wiped off my briefcase with a clean towel and placed the letters carefully inside. The next morning, I took an early subway into the Wall Street District, selecting an address that carried me almost to the end of the island. It was dark with the tallness of the buildings and the narrow streets. Armored cars with alert guards were past, went past as I looked for the number. The streets were full of hurrying people who walked as though they had been wound up and were directed by some unseen control. Many of the men carried dispatch cases and briefcases, and I gripped mine with a sense of importance. And here and there, I saw Negroes who hurried along with leather pouches strapped to their wrists. They received they reminded me fleetingly of prisoners carrying their leg irons as they escaped from a chain gang. Yet they seemed aware of some self-importance, and I wished to stop one and ask him why he was chained to his pouch. Maybe they got paid well for this. Maybe they were chained to money. Perhaps the man with run-down heels ahead of me was chained to a million dollars. I looked to see if there were policemen or detectives with drawn guns following, but there was no one. Or if so, they were hidden in the hurrying crowd. I wanted to follow one of the men to see where he was going. Why did they trust him with all that money? And what would happen if he should disappear with it? But of course, no one would be that foolish. There, this was Wall Street. Perhaps it was guarded, as I had been told post offices were guarded, by men who looked down at you through peepholes in the ceiling and walls, watching you constantly, silently waiting for a wrong move. Perhaps even now an eye had picked me up and watched my every movement. Maybe the face of that clock set in the gray building across the street hid a pair of searching eyes. I hurried to my address and was challenged by the sheer height of the white stone with its sculptured bronze facade. Men and women hurried inside, and after staring for a moment, I followed. Taking the elevator and being pushed to the back of the car, I rose like a rocket, creating a sensation in my crotch as though an important part of myself had been left below in the lobby. At the last stop, I left the car and went down 
a stretch of marble highway until I found the door marked with the trustee's name. But starting to enter, I lost my nerve and backed away. I looked down the hall. It was empty. Why folks were funny. Mr. Bates might not wish to see a Negro the first thing in the morning. I turned and walked down the hall and looked out of the window. I would wait a while. Below me lay South Ferry, and a ship and two barges were passing out into the river. And far out and to the right, I could see, I could make out the Statue of Liberty, her torch almost lost in the fog. Back along the shore, gulls soared through the mist above the docks and down, so far below that it made me dizzy. Crowds were moving. I looked back to a ferry passing the Statue of Liberty. Now, it, it's backwash, a curving line upon the bay, and three gulls swooping down behind it. Behind me, the elevator was letting off passengers, and I heard the cheery voices of women going chattering down the hall. Soon I would have to go in. My uncertainty grew. My appearance worried me. Mr. Bates might not like my suit or the cut of my hair. My chance of a job would be lost. I looked at his name typed neatly across the envelope and worried and wondered how he earned his money. He was a millionaire, I knew. Maybe he had always been. Maybe he was born a millionaire. Never before I, never before had I been so curious about money as now that I believed I was surrounded by it. Perhaps I would get a job here and after a few years would be sent up and down the streets with millions strapped to my arms, a trusted messenger. Then I'd be sent south again to head the college, just as the mayor's cook had been made principal of the school after she'd been too lame to stand before her stove. Only I wouldn't stay north that long. They needed me before that, but now the interview. I found myself face to face with a young woman who looked up from her desk as I glanced swiftly over the large light room, over the comfortable chairs, the ceiling-high bookcases with gold and leather bindings, past a series of portraits, and back again to meet her questioning eyes. She was alone, and I thought, well, at least I'm not too early. Good morning, she said betraying none of the antagonism I had expected. Good morning, I said, advancing. How should I begin? Yes. Is this Mr. Bates' office, I said. Why, yes, it is, she said. Have you an appointment? No, ma'am, I said, and quickly hated myself for saying ma'am to so young a white woman, and in the north, too. I removed the letter from my briefcase, but before I could explain, she said, May I see it, please? I hesitated. I did not wish to surrender the letter except to Mr. Bates, but there was a command in the extended hand, and I obeyed. I surrendered it, expecting her to open it, but instead, after looking at the envelope, she rose and disappeared behind a paneled door without a word. Back across the expanse of carpet to the door, which I had entered, I noticed several chairs, but was undecided to go there. I stood, my hat in my hand, looking around me. One wall caught my eye. It was hung with three portraits of dignified old gentlemen in winged collars who looked down from their frames with an assurance, an arrogance that I had never seen in any except white men and a few bad razor scarred Negroes. Not even Dr. Bledsoe, who had but to look around him without speaking to set the teachers to trembling, had such assurance. So there were the kind of men who stood behind him, 
How did they fit in with the southern white folks? With the men who gave me my scholarship, I was staring, caught in the spell of power and mystery, when the secretary returned. She looked at me oddly and smiled. I'm very sorry, she said, but Mr. Bates is just too busy to see you this morning and asks that you leave your name and address. You'll hear from him by mail. I stood silent with disappointment. Write it here, she said, give, giving me a card. I'm sorry, she said again as I scribbled my address and prepared to leave. I can be reached here at any time, I said. Very good, she said. You should hear very soon. She seemed very kind and interested, and I left in good spirits. My fears were groundless. There was nothing to it. This was New York. I succeeded in reaching several trustees, secretaries during the days that followed, and all were friendly and encouraging. Some looked at me strangely, but I dismissed it since I didn't appear, since it didn't appear to be antagonism. Perhaps they're surprised to see someone like me with introductions to such important men, I thought. Well, there were unseen lines that ran from north to south, and Mr. Norton had called me his destiny. I swung my briefcase with confidence. With things going so well, I distributed my letters in the morning and saw the city during the afternoons, walking about the streets, sitting on subways beside whites, eating with them in the same cafeterias, although I avoided their tables, gave me the eerie, out-of-focus sensation of a dream. My clothes felt ill-fitting, and for all my letters to men of power, I was unsure of how I should act. For the first time, as I swung along the streets, I thought consciously of how I conducted myself at home, I hadn't worried too much about whites as people. Some were friendly and some were not, and you tried not to offend either. But there were but they were but here they all seemed impersonal. And yet when most impersonal they started me but here they all seemed impersonal, and yet when most impersonal they startled me by being polite by begging my pardon, after brushing against me in a crowd. Still, I felt that, even when they were polite, they hardly saw me. That they would have begged the pardon of Jack the Bear. Never glancing his way, if the bear happened to be walking along, minding his business. It was confusing. I did not know if it were desirable or undesirable. But my main concern was seeing trustees and after more than a week of seeing the city and being vaguely encouraged by secretaries, I became impatient. I had distributed all but the letter to Mr. Emerson, who I knew from the papers was away from the city. Several times I started down to see what had happened, but changed my mind. I did not wish to seem too impatient, but time was becoming short, and unless I found work soon, I would never earn enough to enter school by fall. I had already written home that I was working for a member of the trustee board, and the only letter I had received so far was one telling me how wonderful they thought it was and warning me against the ways of the wicked city. Now, I couldn't write them for money without revealing that I had been lying about the job. Finally, I tried to reach the important men by telephone, only to receive polite refusals by their secretaries. But fortunately, I still had the letter to Mr. Emerson. I decided to use it, but instead of handing it over to a secretary, I wrote a letter explaining that I had a message for Dr. Blitz from Dr. Bledsoe, and requesting an appointment. Maybe I've been wrong about the secretaries, I thought. Maybe they destroyed the letters. 
I should have been more careful. I thought of Mr. Norton. If only the last letter had been addressed to him. If only he lived in New York so that I could make a personal appeal. Somehow I felt closer to Mr. Norton and felt that if he should see me, he would remember that it was I whom he connected so closely to his fate. Now it seemed ages ago, and in a different season and a distant land. Actually, it was less than a month. I became energetic and wrote him a letter, expressing my belief that my future would be immeasurably different if only I could work for him, that he would be benefited as well as I. I was especially careful to allow some indication of my ability to come through the appeal. I spent several hours on the typing, destroying copy after copy until I had completed one that was immaculate. Carefully phrased and most respectful, I hurried down and posted it before the final mail collection, suddenly seized with the dizzy conviction that it would bring results. I remained about the building for three days, awaiting an answer. But the letter brought no reply, nor any more than a prayer unanswered by God was it returned. My doubts grew. Perhaps all was not well. I remained in my room all the next day. I grew conscious that I was afraid, more afraid here in my room than I had ever been in the South, and all the more because here there was nothing concrete to lay it to. All the secretaries had been encouraging. In the evening, I went out to a movie, a picture of frontier life with heroic Indian fighting and struggles against flood, storm, and forest fire. With the outnumbered settlers winning each engagement, an epic of wagon trains rolling ever westward. I forgot myself, although there was no one like me taking part in the adventure, and left the dark room in a lighter mood. But that night I dreamed of my grandmother, but that night I dreamed of my grandfather and awoke depressed. I walked out of the building with a queer feeling that I was playing a part in some scheme which I did not understand. Somehow I felt that Bledsoe and Norton were behind it, and all day I was inhibited in both speech and conduct, for fear that I might say or do something scandalous. But this was all fantastic, I told myself. I was being too impatient. I could wait for the trustees to make a move. Perhaps I was being subjected to a, a test of some kind. They hadn't told me the rules. I knew, but the feeling persisted. Perhaps my exile would end suddenly, and I would be given a scholarship to return to the campus. But when? How long? Something had to happen soon. I would have to find a job to tide me over. My money was almost gone, and anything might happen. I had been so confident that I had failed to put aside the price of tra train fare home. I was miserable and dared not talk to anyone about my problems, not even the officials at Men's House. For since they had learned that I was to be assigned an important job, they treated me with a certain deference. Therefore, I was careful to hide my growing doubts. After all, I thought, I might have to ask for credit, and I'll have to appear a good risk. No, the thing to do was to keep faith. I'd start out once more in the morning. Something was certain to happen tomorrow, and it did. I received a letter from Mr. Emerson.